Welcome to Colors of Heroism, where we talk about using the Magic the Gathering color pie to make better characters in your tabletop RPGs. You can click on the card on screen right now to learn why you'd want to do that, but in this video we just don't have the time. So, Red is the color of freedom through action. When you bristle at the imposition of too many rules, you are leaning into your red side. Whenever you decide to just take a day to yourself, play video games instead of studying or going to work, when you put doing what you want to do over your responsibilities, that's a little red, too. Whenever you go with your gut, make a decision impulsively instead of taking a lot of time or overthinking it, then you're leaning into your red side. Not to say that it's all rash action. Red is the color that privileges emotion and happiness above other principles. Hedonism is deeply red, and as a moral philosophy, hedonism is really quite sophisticated and very convincing. If you're interested in learning more about it, you can click on the card on the screen now, but suffice to say, every other color has a tendency to ignore emotions and how we feel about things. And that's quite strange, really. I'm showing my own red tendencies, but I think that any system that fails to account for how the people within it feel is a system with some major shortcomings. Red is the color of passion, and of love, and of the kind of friendship that we all mean when we say the word friendship. White can help a person because they think helping people is virtuous, and black can help a person because they think it's beneficial for them. But red is the color of empathy and of caring. It's also the color of caring selectively. When people disagree, red is happy to lean into violence to solve that problem even when peace could have achieved the same result. A great example of these kind of characteristics in a character in media is Tank Girl from the comic Tank Girl. Bundle of Chaos, Rebecca is drunk, wild, violent, and prone to random acts of catharsis. Having totally failed to fit in with any kind of authority or order, she walks through her life making the world a better place incidentally, by destroying the various forms of authority which, in her universe, are mostly evil or oppressive. She loves freely and is dearly in love with her mutant kangaroo boyfriend, though she refuses to be constrained by him in any way. It'd be tricky to play a character like Tank Girl to any capacity that a DM would enjoy running for, or that the other players at the table would enjoy playing with. But when red is tempered by other colors, you get very robust and realized characters that are a lot of fun to play. White is the color of peace through structure, of imposing rules upon people so as to create a better situation for everyone. White is happy to restrict freedom to get the result it wants, and red is diametrically opposed on this issue, finding rules and restrictions as bad in and of themselves. Any red character that leans into white is going to have to contend with this issue, and interestingly enough, I think that most characters players make, especially newer players, have this as their color identity. So how do they resolve the conflict? Many players want to be fundamentally good in the game, and not have too many restrictions. And that's a common way that red-white manifests itself. White-red does want to do its best for other people, but it's concerned chiefly with its own freedom and the freedoms of others. It'll skirt rules and restrictions and encourage others to do the same if that's what it takes to get that goal achieved. I think the quintessential white-red moment is the freeing of an innocent man condemned to death, a la Will Turner, at the end of the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Most people, I think, feel that that kind of thing is a good thing to do, fundamentally, and so they create characters that fall on that side of the issue. When I think of red leaning white, I think Spider-Man. And I'm actually going against D&D YouTuber canon here. Matt Colville has staked down that he thinks Spider-Man is neutral good, a hero not interested in law or chaos. But of course, Spider-Man has a stake in law and chaos, and he's not on the law side. Again, particularly comic book characters have such a history and so many versions, and they behave a little differently under each writer. In general, Spider-Man selfishly lets a criminal go because he dislikes the victim of the crime, and it's only when the criminal murders his father figure that Peter realizes he's done something wrong. He's motivated by guilt, by shame, by a sense of responsibility, white principles expressing themselves through the motivating power of emotion. He's also technically a criminal, which is not particularly lawful. He's not exactly going through due process when he snaps the legs of criminals with the power of spider strength. I might get some pushback on this really, but think about it for a second. Spider-Man is not motivated by a desire to help people in the abstract, or really in principle. He's motivated emotionally to help others because he knows the emotional consequences others might face if he refuses. Perfectly red, leaning white. The other color that red has big disagreements with is blue, the color of perfection through knowledge. Blue thinks, plans, and it tries to be as unemotional as possible. Red thinks that this cerebral approach is essentially the same as death, that life is only lived in the moment. It seems to be a big problem for characters to try and overcome, to address, to internalize. But red and blue are closer bedfellows than you might think at first. 
a red-blue character might marry intellect and emotion, planning and impulse, by mastering the art of improvisation. Again, this is well-trodden ground in culture. The wizard with a hair-trigger temper. The sorcerer who learns to control her power. All archetypes that work nicely for our purposes. Look at Indiana Jones. In his everyday life, Indy is mostly blue. A professor, an archaeologist, happy and at home in the world of academia and learning. But when he has a half-decent excuse, he leaps the chance to get his hands dirty, to seek thrills, to fly across the world, to impetuously get himself way over his head, just to feel a cheap thrill, just to feel alive. He doesn't exactly abandon his blue when he does this, using his quick thinking to navigate dangerous situations, and translating Hebrew on the fly to save his own life in dangerous puzzles. But Indy is a superhero in librarian's clothing, and that's why audiences love him. Red does have colours it agrees a bit more with, though. Its friends are black and green. Black is the colour of satisfaction, or power, through opportunity. The colour of choosing to satisfy yourself at the expense of anyone and anything else. Black thinks that everyone needs an advocate, and that your greatest advocate is always going to be yourself. Red and black oppose white, and so they despise order, rules, and group thinking. This colour pair isn't really inherently heroic, and so if you want a black-red heroic character, you have to do a little bit of work. Red and black lean into hedonism and personal satisfaction when they come together, but it's entirely impossible for a hero in the party to be engaging in heroism just to satisfy themselves. They might like the other members of their party, they might just get a lot of satisfaction out of playing the hero. If you're a fan of Adventure Time, come on, grab your friends, then this will all have sounded quite familiar. Marceline, the Vampire Queen, can be selfish, rude, brutish, and manipulative, but fundamentally, her friends can count on her to direct her energy towards helping them out, if only for no other reason than she enjoys their company. Passionate, selfish, but when she is motivated to help others, she is extremely motivated. Green is the colour of growth through acceptance. It's the perfect middle ground between white and red, law and chaos. Green is always looking to be in touch with its natural ecosystem. Nature can be chaotic, selfish, cruel, collaborative, structured, beautiful. Red-green characters put a lot of stock in how they're feeling and doing things intuitively, abhorring Blue's meddling nature and its tendency to overthink. This colour pair is especially rife for great character work. Look at Moana. She feels constrained constantly by the rules her father imposes on her, about staying in the confines of her island, and she feels equally constrained by her destined future as a ruler of that tiny island. Moana is constantly motivated to sail, feeling the ocean call to her like nothing else, and she rubs up against the rules of her society constantly. However, Moana's tension between fitting in with what her society wants of her and being true to herself is resolved when she learns that her people used to be voyagers who would sail the sea on ships constantly. Her father has forced their people to be landlocked and moored all their boats out of a fear and a personal trauma that he endured as a child. Moana's culture is naturally supposed to be freedom-loving explorers, and that's the identity that she embraces. The passion and exuberance she expresses when she realizes that her desires aren't deviant, that there isn't anything wrong with her, that what she wants is just a natural and normal way to connect to a large legacy of others. It's just a genuinely very delightful moment, and it's something that some members of my audience are going to relate to more than others. Of course, one of the cool things about this system that we have here is it allows you to think about your characters in the broad strokes of how they might develop, and in more concrete terms than you might be used to. Imagine a character like Moana, a warrior who enjoys exploration, who has a deep love of her culture and its traditions, who's motivated by the desire to be free, to experience new sensations, to help her family, whether they're blood relatives or found friends. She's red and green, but how might she develop? The remaining colours we can choose from here are white, black and blue, and we'll look at each in turn. If our Moana-like character, we'll look at our colour, Samesa, from the rest of this, finds herself as the leader of a sect of her people, she might suddenly have to contend with how difficult it can be to corral a bunch of disconnected freedom-loving explorers. She might find the virtue in white, coming to care about her community, imposing some rules and structure to keep the people strong and together. As red becomes yet more tempered with white, she becomes a little less chaotic, a little less free, but more connected to the people around her. Of course, it could go the other way, if instead of finding herself becoming more invested in people around her, in structure and community, Zemesa could become more self-focused, more opposed to rules and restrictions. She might free herself from the finer details of culture and tradition altogether, leaning not into community, not a tribe, but into a warlike band, taking an interest in black. She's still interested in exploration, but now when she finds new places, she thinks of them in terms of what she can take and exploit. 
She steals what she will and brutally cuts down anyone who gets in her way. She becomes hardened, enjoying cruelty and pleasure, enjoying flexing the power to dominate others, the queen of a terrible black company. Or she could become blue. This is the odd one out. This color disagrees with both red and green. What could cause Samesa to adopt a philosophy and way of life that ameliorates the conflict of both passion versus logic and internal versus external validation? One way that this could all happen is if Samesa's desire to explore changes its roots somewhat. Instead of seeking out new experiences, she might want to explore to find knowledge. Knowledge of people, of places, of culture, of nature, of landmarks, of anything. Perhaps she writes songs to commemorate this information, becoming a wandering bard of sorts, always learning, always creating, immortalizing specific instances of time and place and spreading them far and wide. I mean, I actually quite like that myself, that's a new character concept, alright? But the system isn't just an algorithm for long-term character thinking. It works just as well in the short term, as long-term fans of this series must be getting sick of hearing Simulating a whole person is tricky, and keeping the fundamentals of their colors in your mind can make it reasonable and you can now make coherent snap judgments when you're at the table. Let's overview an example situation. Party is on the road, when suddenly they overcome a scene of violence. Some cruel human bandits have attacked a caravan of lizard folk in an ambush, wounding the warriors and stealing the lizard folk's famed and very valuable sugar beets, which is a large part of their village's livelihood. The thieves are getting away, but one lizard folk warrior in particular is very badly hurt. Her neck is deeply cut, and she's losing a lot of blood, and fast. If she doesn't get to the nearby healer, she will surely die. But if the party takes her to the nearby town for treatment, the thieves will certainly get away, and without them, these lizard folk will be in real economic trouble. How might your character respond? Well, if they're red-black, they're probably not motivated by justice or altruism anyway. They enjoy violence, they enjoy pleasure. They might only help if the lizard folk promise them a share of those juicy, juicy beats. But if your character is red-green, they respond to situations more emotionally. Sorry, lizard folk warrior, but instinct is as instinct does, and our character will run wildly after those bandits, grinning all the time, eager to pulverize them until their tender flesh is identical to those juicy, juicy beats. If your character is red-blue, then th this actually could be the perfect opportunity for them to try out a new spell or battle position. I mean, after all, if they succeed, then they're heroes, and if they fail, well, all that happens is that these lizard folks lose their juicy, juicy beats. If your character is red-white, they'll likely feel terrible about doing so, but they will leave the one woman to die, because one woman is nothing in the face of her whole village's well-being. So they'll rescue those juicy, juicy beats, and bring fervent justice down upon the beat thieves. That poor woman, no one's invested in saving her. Or are they? Can you think of any reason why any of these color combinations might become invested in saving the woman over collecting those juicy, juicy beats? I remind you, they're pretty juicy. There's a huge variation within these philosophies. You know, there's an infinite spectrum, really. So I'm interested to hear any takes you have in the comments. In this video, we've done an overview of red and its four color pairs, leaning into popular culture to get a wider sense of perspective. We've taken a gander at using the color pie to frame character development in an actionable way, and we've looked into using colors to make believable snap decisions as our characters. If you like this video, you could subscribe to get more. Check out our Discord if you want a place to chat Magic D&D or anything else really, we do have fun there, and if you know someone making or playing a character that you think this video would help, please share it with them. And yeah, I think that's that. Again, safe home.